Shall I give you a sort of five minutes? Shall I yeah. give you a warning? Yeah, I want to get to one of 45 minutes. 45, yeah. If I'm still okay, going, perfect. just give me a five minute. Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Let's have some quiet, that IDS trick there. Very good. Well, fantastic to see so many of you here this afternoon for the next in our series of Sussex Development Lectures, focusing in on the Sustainable Development Goals, the synergies, the tensions, the opportunities for turning them into action. And we couldn't have a more important topic today, thinking about climate change, um, given the urgency of the challenges before us, um, the ramping up in some quarters of political interest in actually doing something about this. Um, and yet the deep, inextricable and quite complicated connections between climate change and development, indeed as espoused in the other sustainable development goals. So I think we're in for a treat and we couldn't have anybody better to talk about this this afternoon than Peter Newell. So um, Pete is a professor in the School of Global Studies. He's um, a professor of international relations. Um, he's also part of the Center for Global Political Economy um, and he's researched director of the Rapid Transition Alliance. He's very much uh, a global and UK leading academic um, around climate change and its politics. Um, and he's going to be talking to us this afternoon about climate and development, a tale of two crises and how they interlink with each other. And I hope what the world and all of us now need to do about them. So without more ado, um, over to Pete. As ever, we have an online audience as well so very warm welcome to all of you and when we come to questions and comments there'll be an opportunity for all of you to join in um, and I do encourage people to tweet um, using the Sussex Dev hashtag um, if you want to comment on the lecture while it's in progress so thanks very much Pete Thank Thanks very much, Melissa. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming out this afternoon. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back in IDS. It's a place I once worked many years ago. Um, and so when I was asked to come up with a title for um, this evening's talk, um, I came up with this one, Climate Change and, and Development, A Tale of Two Crises. Crises. And it was actually the title of a paper I wrote uh, for an IDS bulletin, a special issue on climate change and development back in 2004, so 15 years ago. Um, this issue was put together and I wrote a paper with exactly the same title uh, in that issue. So what I did first of all was to go back to that special issue, to that article I, I wrote, that I wrote at that time, and ask, well, well, what's changed 15 years on? What's the story now? And the first thing I noted in the piece was the fact that climate change had been so neglected as an issue by the mainstream development community in many ways should not come as a surprise. Not only because despite the rhetoric most environmental issues at that time um, had not been effectively mainstreamed within development policy and practice. But because I was arguing and would still argue now that climate change in particular raises a series of uncomfortable challenges for the theory and practice of development. To the extent that climate change highlights the unsustainability of the fossil fueled growth trajectory that underpins the contemporary global economy, it focuses scrutiny on the economic growth strategies promoted by institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. And because of the enormous uh, global carbon footprint that results from the increased movement of goods transported around the world as a result of lower trade barriers, the World Trade Organization and the governments that create it um, also necessarily enter the spotlight. So the relative lack of action that I noted at the time, and you could argue the same applies today, contra most accounts at the time, which were focusing on the difficult, painful, diplomatic process of trying to arrive at global agreements on this issue. My argument then, and it would be to some extent now, was that it's more about vested interest, beneficiaries of the current way of doing things that are um, holding back progress and stopping us moving in a more sustainable direction. And I suggested that the development community for, for that community, climate change was being interpreted within very conventional frames of analysis as a problem of bad governance, inefficient markets, 
So to cite a donor report that was published at the time, so again, we're talking 15 years ago now, but it said, by making public institutions responsive, participative, and accountable to those they serve, decision-making processes and implementation activities can be robust enough to deal with the challenge of climate change. So the discourse abounded with notions of win-win, opportunities for synergy, um, and of course it was suggested that action that was more demand-driven uh, would be uh, more able to respond to the needs of the poor. Now my purpose in this piece, in this special issue, was not to pour scorn on the development mantras as many in practice uh, contain valuable insights into the political institutional dimensions of the climate change problem. But rather it was to show that by not thinking beyond these conventional frames of interpretation, we miss an important opportunity to affect more substantive change in preventing climate change from further immiserizing the lives of the poor by critically revisiting uh, conventional development strategies and their role in producing the problem in the first place. So, fast forward 15 years, what's changed? Some things clearly have. Donors, multilateral banks and institutions are much more engaged with the issue than they were back then. We've seen a world development report on the question of climate change. There are a whole suite of new funding mechanisms, things like the climate investment funds that the World Bank oversees, a greater focus on adaptation to climate change. We have an adaptation fund, etc. Clearly the issue has ridden, risen up the international agenda, driven by ever more dire warnings from the IPCC, the scientific body uh, that's, that provides analysis of the state of affairs and what needs to be done, but also by the increasing intensity of extreme weather events events and an appreciation, a growing appreciation, uh, that it's the poorest in society who've contributed least to the problem that will be in the front line of the impacts that will suffer some of the worst consequences of climate change. So clearly the issue has gone from uh, being one around the science uh, to being a policy issue to an increasingly central development concern, but also over time a question of human rights and social justice. But alongside this story of acceptance, incorporation, recognition, there's a parallel story of negation, denial, blind spots and cognitive dissonance. In other words, I'll argue, the development industry has struggled to deal with climate change just as the climate system can no longer support development as usual. So what do I mean by that? So despite the growing acknowledgement of the climate crisis, I think we need to unpack the nature of this crisis. For whom is it a crisis? Judging by the lack of action uh, in many quarters, clearly not everyone sees it as a crisis. So what is it a crisis of? What does it represent? For me, climate change does actually represent the limits of conventional development as an ideology and practice, but that's not a commonly held view. And of course, it's not just climate change that does that. There's a whole range of issues around inequality and unsustainability of systems of food and agriculture, water and energy, to name a few. And so the dominant economic system is performing poorly on a range of grounds, though its inability to address climate change is certainly one of them, and a very important one. So that's start there. Where are we at? This is uh, the emissions gap report. It's the latest one, as you can see, published in 2018. Um, and what it suggests is that global greenhouse gas emissions must peak by 2020. So we've got one year <laughs> to peak these emissions and the gap must be closed by 2030. Hence this figure you've probably seen in a lot of the media about 12 years, 11 years to turn this around to get us onto a 1.5 degree trajectory. And if the emissions gap is not closed within that time frame, all hope of a 1.5 degree pathway, and this is what the Paris Agreement is aiming at, um, is out the window. And it's possible also that even a two degree temperature trajectory would be out of reach. So pathways reflecting current NDCs, so these are the nationally determined contributions, okay? These are the national strategy that governments have come up with themselves, their com com uh, commitments and promises about what they're gonna do to try and achieve the Paris goal. Currently leave us on track for at least, at least three degrees warming, possibly quite, more, uh, quite a lot more. And what this implies, big issue given what I've just said about the fossil fuel um, domination of the global economy at the moment, 80 to 90% of coal reserves will need to remain in the ground, 35% of oil reserves and 50% of gas reserves. And even assuming all countries fulfil these pledges, and there are, that's a big if uh, in and of itself, that would still only account for a third of the emissions uh, required to get us down to two degrees, let alone 1.5. 
What we've then seen is this report. This was published um, by the IPCC, this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, back in October last year. So they were asked to look into this question of how on earth do we get the world onto a 1.5 trajectory. Now, optimistically, this report said that that goal is still feasible, though it's hugely challenging to try and achieve it. Limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, they said, required transformative systemic change. Transformative systemic change. Okay, so it requires upscaling, acceleration of far-reaching climate mitigation across all sectors of the world, all regions of the world. And this is really strong language coming from a body that's often criticised for being overly conservative and overly cautious in how they deal with the science of climate change. And here, using that type of language, transformative systemic change, it could be something that Marx and Engels might have written in the Communist Manifesto. So, Clearly, substantial effort is required to bring these NDCs, these national strategies, in line with the 1.5 uh, goal. We need to increase the pay, pace and scale. Um, and these, the transitions, therefore, need to be deeper and faster. And the real challenge is that those, these, these have been observed in particular places at particular times in history. We don't yet have historical parallels of how these things have happened simultaneously. So we're in uncharted waters in many ways. We have useful historical reference points, which I'll come back to later on. Uh, but the challenge we face in many ways is unique in terms of its scale. So what does this mean? What's at stake? Um, some of you may be familiar with this graphic. It was part of the Stern Review that was published more than 10 or 11 years ago now. Um, but it's a useful way of capturing what's at stake when we talk about these abstract figures of 1.5 or 2 or 3 degrees. So you can see, even if we hit the Paris target, 1.5, I'm told I have to stay here for the reasons of the camera, so normally I would be wanting to move over there and uh, point to these different figures. But if you look at 1.5, we're already talking about glaciers disappearing, damage to coral reefs. As you move towards 2 degrees, you're starting to talk about uh, failures of crops, uh, decreases in water availability. Now again, to go back to what I was just saying, at the moment we're heading far more towards 3 plus degrees, and look at what that implies in terms of water availability, impacts on crops. Uh, species extinction, intensity of storms. This is very serious indeed. This is development in reverse. Okay? This is undoing the gains of development that have been made um, over, over the last decades. So, does this, as Naomi Klein said, change everything? Her argument was that climate does force us to rethink the nature of the economic system, the compatibility of, globe, of um, capitalism in many ways uh, with climate change. So does it? Let me now talk uh, a little bit about the origins of the climate change problem in order to understand the links to development and the intertwined history of climate and development that I'm trying to portray tonight. Understanding a bit about where we've come from uh, why things are the way they are in order to understand what the prospects are for change and transformation. And of course the story starts with the Industrial Revolution. Um, in many ways this is the origins of the climate crisis. Um, they can be found in that rapid expansion of fossil fuels at the time of the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th century. This was the birth, if you like, of fossil fuel civilization. But as the academic, Swedish academic Andreas Malm has written in his book Fossil Capital, it was not, as conventionally assumed, just about coal-fired steam power offering a cheaper, more abundant source of energy. It was rather about the superior control of labour that it afforded, allowing capital to concentrate production at the most profitable sites and during the most convenient hours. So not only is this story interesting and important in terms of how lock-in, this intense carbon lock-in that we now experience, was created, but also in relation to subsequent narratives that have been constructed about how we undo that lock-in and reverse that lock-in and create a newer low-carbon industrial revolution, which is the sort of language being used, where the suggestion is that we need to create new sites of accumulation for business and for capital by mobilising finance in new ways, that we need to stimulate and accelerate waves of creative destruction, that we need the, to allow the market to determine appropriate energy sources and technologies. Uh, those, and it will naturally sift and select and support those which are more efficient and competitive and for which there is greatest demand. Another predominant narrative is this one that I'm sure many of you in this room will be familiar with, of the, the Anthropocene. 
Um, this has gained a lot of popularity in recent years of un uh, in terms of understanding human impact on global environmental systems. And on one level, it obviously and to some extent accurately describes a generic problem of human impact on the global climate system. But on another, we can be far more specific, and this is why some people prefer to refer to it as the Capitalocene. So according to one study by Richard Heed and colleagues in the journal Climatic Change, just 90 companies, 90 companies, caused two-thirds of man-made global warming emissions and this includes household names like Shell, BP, Exxon and Chevron. More worryingly still though is the fact that half of the estimated emissions were produced in the last 25 years. Now that's well past the date when governments and corporations became well aware that rising greenhouse gas emissions from the burning of coal and oil in particular were causing dangerous climate change. But it's not just the production of climate change um, that is socially differentiated, however. What makes climate change a social as well as environmental crisis is the way through impacts and also our dominant responses to the problem of climate change that it can magnify and widen and further exploit existing inequalities, as a lot of research across Sussex and IDS has shown so vividly. So historically then, this evolution of the fossil fuel era intersects with a mixture of colonialism, and patriarchy, producing racialized, class-based and gendered patterns of injustice, which exacerbates, which climate change exacerbates. And we can see this then not just in terms of the direct impacts and deprivations around uh, impacts on lands, loss of livelihoods due to changes in rainfall and agriculture, for example, or disruption from extreme weather events, uh, but also indirectly through green grabs, uh, dispossession of land for carbon sequestration projects, again, that work here at IDF and elsewhere as uh, pointed to. And of course the very basis of carbon trading which has been one of the dominant responses to climate change rests on these inequalities and the fact that it's cheaper to reduce emissions in parts of the global south or what's been referred to as accumulation by decarbonisation. So let's fast forward in the story a little bit to what's also been called the Great Acceleration, because it's an important turning point again in this history I'm trying, trying to construct of the, the story of climate change and development and the ways in which they're intertwined. So insofar as the contemporary notion of development was invented, as Arturo Escobar and others have claimed, with President Truman's declaration in his inaugural address in 1949 that greater production is the key to prosperity and peace and to uh, relieving the suffering of those in poverty, the birth of development as an idea at that moment coincided with this great acceleration and it's a great acceleration as you can see in resource use around energy, fertilizer, paper, water, a whole series of uh, key products, resources and services in the global economy. And so you could argue that at the very moment of its inception of this particular notion of development we were already setting in train development in, in reverse um, through climate change. And what we've seen then over time is these shifts towards Fordism, mass consumerism and then globalisation have intensified and globalised these modes of extraction and exchange and of course the result has been rising temperatures uh, over time. Now this is not a static picture. What we've seen with shifts in the global economy is this changing geography of global emissions. So it may not be that clear to all of you at the back, but some of the bigger bubbles over time, as you all know, have become China, India, South Africa, Brazil, uh, BRICS economies, if you like, to use that um, language. And so we've got this new geopolitical landscape um, of emissions that's blurred some of the lines of responsibility uh, between North and South. But also within states, this isn't just about global shifts, it's also about uh, inequalities. And so this graphic shows that how the picture changes fundamentally when you're talking about just aggregate figures of greenhouse gas emissions, where you know China would be the leader and that's the US and the EU, whereas if you look at it in terms of per capita emissions, those countries drop right down. And there you can see India, Brazil, China, uh, much lower levels of per capita emissions. And so the global inequalities, if you like, that bedevil all development progress are very apparent when you look at the climate story uh, through those lenses as well. Now again, the problem isn't just climate change. 
However contestable the planetary boundaries concept might be, and I'm looking at Melissa here <laughs> and many others who've been critical of this way of framing things, I think it does nevertheless point to or flag warning signs that we should heed about the unsustainable trajectory of the global economy in relation to a whole series of uh, key ecosystems. Now you might have thought, going back to uh, Naomi Klein's big question, um, that this would have created a crisis of legitimacy or triggered broader reflection about the nature and sustainability of the development project, maybe even a revision to some prevailing orthodoxies. But has it? So now I want to turn the second part of the talk to thinking about how the development community has responded to the nature of this threat. What has been the response? Overall, I would suggest that on the surface of things, there has been this growing recognition, there have been institutional reforms, recognition of the gravity of the issue in lots of quarters. But huge political effort has had to be invested by key development actors and institutions in positioning climate change as an opportunity for development and growth. It's been primarily defined as a question of transition. Okay, so substituting technologies, switching energy sources, strengthening institutions, changing pricing mechanisms. But this has been at the expense of recognising the indictment that climate change poses of the existing global economy and negating the need for broader transformations and bigger shifts in political power. Now, the political attempt to manage this terrain to ensure that politics and policy reinforce a broadly market liberal approach to transitions within capitalism opposed, as opposed to broader transformations of capitalism uh, was understood by Antonio Gramsci as transformismo. Now apologies for the, trans the uh, translation if there are any Italian speakers in the audience. But what he's referring to here is this tension between the increasingly need, needed, um, recognised need for transformation and the ability of incumbent actors, so those governments, corporations, in institutions that control the production, the technology, the finance, to narrow the debate to more incremental questions of, of transition through this process. The ways in which they're able to accommodate some of these pressures that Melissa was alluding to and which I'll come back to talk about later on, um, in order not to disrupt prevailing power relations. Uh, and I'll describe in a moment some of the ways in which they've tried to do this. So I'll try to suggest then that this notion of trans transformismo is a useful way of trying to understand how the development community has dealt with the, with the uh, problem of climate change and the critiques it um, expresses or um, throws out, if you like, towards the development community. And I'll argue that this dynamic is apparent in a number of ways. One is through material power, very basic forms of material power, what some critics or political economists refer to as disciplinary neoliberalism. This is about the reuse of uh, carrots and sticks and rewards by the development community to encourage developing countries to follow a particular line, to adopt particular types of reforms through the giving and taking of aid, for example. So thinking of some work we were doing in Kenya a number of years ago on energy transitions in Kenya, um, I'm reminded of a quote that came from a, a World Bank official who was talking positively about what Kenya had done, uh, a more private-led, export-led energy transition that was being adopted by the country at the time. And he said, Kenya has always been very private sector focused and avoided the virulent forms of socialism of some of its neighbours. Uh, he was referring to Tanzania, I think. And so aid becomes conditional on adopting the right types of reforms, in this case power sector reforms, that then get rewarded with new forms of bilateral and multilateral aid and the opening up of opportunities for foreign capital to meet shortfalls in supply. And this is all at the time when we're talking about transitions and the management of transitions and the need for governments to get more involved in managing key sectors. So just as we're saying we need to bring the state back in and you have Mariana Matsukatu talking about the green entrepreneurial state. In, in neoliberal terms, it's still very much about rolling back the state and opening up more opportunities for business to manage these transitions. But we also see this material power exercised very blatantly in terms of promoting business as usual. So this is direct financial support from some of these institutions towards fossil fuel uh, companies. I won't go through all of these stats, but you can see uh, the amounts of money that are still being invested. So despite all this rhetoric, despite the existence of clean investment funds, despite numerous reports talking about the gravity of this issue, still disproportionate amounts of finance go towards uh, fossil fuels in all parts of the world. And there was a letter that went in today to the African Development Bank whose funds are still, uh, I think it's about 45% dedicated towards fossil fuels. So 
this is the exercise of, the, of material power. Institutionally, though, neoliberal transitions, if you like, also try to prepare the ground for foreign investors in various ways, creating an enabling environment for them. And again, pulling an example from some, the work we were doing in Kenya some, some years ago, um, a geo de geothermal development company was set up to try and promote lower carbon forms of energy, which on one level could be a positive and good thing. But what was interesting was the way in which the risks associated with that development were distributed. So it was a state entity that was set up to do some some of the, the mapping and the, and the initial exploration before private investors then come in and uh, clean up on, on some of the profits. And so it's very typical of the type of model that's, that's being rolled out. Now interestingly, critical writers sometimes talk about this as depoliticization. But it actually, for me, it requires an awful lot of political work to, to bring about these sorts of shifts and to bring about the sorts of reforms that powerful actors are wanting to see. And they have to prepare the ground for interventions. One consultant in uh, Kenya told me an interesting story about the way in which this happens. Um, the way in which donors will say, well, look, there's clearly a problem with the delivery of energy services. There's a lack of people with access to electricity. The institutions we currently have are not working very well. So then they bring in a suite of consultants to do a study to identify what is the problem. And sure enough, the problem is the need for power sector reform, for unbundling, and for privatization. The donors then create a strategy and a process to implement this, which the government, without a great deal of of choice or autonomy is expected to adopt and then what follows quite quickly after that are a whole series of trade fairs and, and business events where foreign investors are invited in to make the most of these opportunities that are being opened up by levering open the sector to, to foreign ca capital. So that's the institutional exercise of power that I see going on here. But it also occurs discursively and we see this around ideas about climate compatible development that many of you, any of you doing master's courses in this area you may have come across this term, it's very popular. People talk about climate smart cities, climate smart agriculture, which is promoted by bodies like the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Bank. And of course they have some value, there's something important going on there, but they also obscure often the drivers of climate change and climate crisis. Um, they accommodate critiques of industrial agriculture and its role in climate change. Um, so, for example, this quote, this is from a group of activists that were quite critical of the way in which the climate smart agriculture uh, debate has been, has been framed to exclude focus on the very industries, which, as you can see in this quote, that they consider to be driving climate change. So it's obscuring what's, what's really going on. It's lending legitimacy to the very actors and interests uh, that need to be more regulated. And at a deeper level still, of course, we see it in attempts to manage the contradictions by advocating greener growth, so that whatever the problem is, more growth. Uh, is always the answer and we can see many different manifestations uh, of this. So overall then, my point is not to downplay real progress that, ha that is being made. There are transitions underway um, in energy, in transport, to less extent in food and agriculture. Um, there are attempts to try and do things differently and on our website, this Rapid Transition Alliance that I'm part of, we have a number of those cases and I'll give you the link at the end and there's also some, some reports down here at the front. You know, there are, you can point to community energy, interesting initiatives around public transport, pedestrianisation, divestment movements, I'll come on to some of these things. There are important things going on, I don't want to take that away or play down their significance. Um, and I also want to suggest this isn't an unquestioned uh, hegemonic project. So despite bringing Gramsci into the conversation, I wouldn't say this is a completely successful hegemonic project. I would talk more about neoliberalisation as an ongoing, uneven process. It's not linear. It hasn't reached an end state. It's full of contradictions. And it does provide entry points for change. Yet clearly, going back to what I was saying earlier on in the talk, we're nowhere near the level of ambition required, um, as those IPCC and UNEP reports make um, very, very clear indeed. <laughs> So what's significant, it's not just the direct impacts of climate change, um, of the development industry in terms of financing infrastructures, it's also that the ideology and the practice of global development has shaped the tools and constrained the policy options and frankly our imagination when it comes to dealing with this uh, key threat that we're facing now. And the consequences of the failure to deal with that um, 
and to address these bigger need, the bigger need for structural transformation of one sort or another um, is the ongoing un inherent unsustainability of conventional uh, development models. So I think we are still seeing what I referred to earlier as development in reverse. So more optimistically, positively, how do we uh, move beyond this? How do we go beyond development uh, as usual? And for me, one of the key things is about challenging these power relations. It is about standing up to powerful incumbent actors who increasingly, it's interesting for me, I've seen this a lot in the last few years, the coal industry, the oil industry, some of the key fossil fuel incumbents really making the case now that their role is tackling energy poverty. They may not have got it right on climate change, but we can't phase out too quickly because they're meeting the needs of the poor. They're making these cl claims uh, increasingly uh, more strongly, more vocally, more vociferously, and some of those claims, I think, uh, need to be challenged. And it's understandable, this is an old graph, but you can see that from the fact it says world development movement and not <laughs> global justice now. But it was an attempt to map these very close, intricate webs of power, political, social, institutional power, that bind government officials to financial actors and to business actors. It's a key challenge to prise those apart, to lever them, to expose them, to try and um, move things in a different direction. And I think contrary to the instincts of, of many people in the development industry, it really means focusing attention on the rich, on the 1%. So when we've got these finite carbon budgets at stake, it is about the explicit links between extreme inequality and overconsumption. And it's not popular to state that how those of us in the richer part of the world produce and consume energy, food and water, and how we meet our transport, heating and dietary needs all need to radically change. It's far more comfortable to go with this dominant narrative about the need for tweaks to pricing, to markets, plugging in different technologies, alternative energy sources, incremental policy reforms of one sort or another. But I think increasingly the time has come to put down limits rather than leave it to the market to decide which, which ways forward we go, whether it's energy energy, food, transport. We need to address what a lot of people are referring to as supply side climate policy. So Andrew Sims and I wrote a piece in The Guardian, some of you may have seen it last, last year, calling for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. And it's got quite a lot of traction. There was a letter that Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein and many other signs supporting this. And there's now an NGO coalition around this, really trying to push this forward. And it's riding with the momentum that's coming from a number of governments saying that they won't develop reserves they have of oil, coal and gas. So from Belize to Costa Rica, New Zealand, many other countries are starting to sort of say they will leave certain resources in the ground. This is what I mean by supply side policies. It's not just regulating emissions going into the atmosphere. It's keeping the stuff in the ground uh, in the first place. And this requires, I think, a more critical view of, of pricing. So although the orthodoxy, the dominant approach is to set up more and more carbon markets and emission trading schemes around the world, I would argue that we need a, a different approach, that that's unlikely to get us very far. It certainly hasn't done uh, so far. And we need to repurpose some of the key institutions of global governance, whether it's the World Bank or the WTO, to bring them in line with the Paris Agreement and more ambitious forms of climate uh, policy. And this is what I mean by this different approach. If you, if you think that the climate regime, the various agreements we've had, whether it's the Framework Convention, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, they're trying to deal with one part of the story, the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. What we've also seen, though, over time is increasing emphasis on payments for ecosystem services, on green carbon and blue carbon, looking at the value and the services provided by oceans, by mangroves or by forests, trying to quantify those things and then trade them to create a new site of accumulation, if you like, new business opportunities to make money out of climate change. But what I'm seeing from Extinction Rebellion, from the climate justice movement and from many others, and also this attempt we have now about a whole new approach, is to try and argue that we have to keep those resources in the ground uh, in the first place. And there are sources of hope that things are changing. There are waves of resistance that we're seeing all the time. And I noticed there was a flyer here for the um, youth climate you strike for climate tomorrow down in Brighton please come along uh, this is really catching on um, we're seeing the rise of uh, extinction rebellion but we're also seeing you know protests all around the UK around fracking um, resistance to pipeline projects in the U in the US around Excel and Dakota etc often led by environmental defenders by indigenous people's groups um, 
there's a lot going on there and I think pushing the supply side side of things is really important. There's something now called the Powering Past Coal Coalition which the UK is uh, exercising leadership in slightly surprisingly. So we are still capable of exercising leadership in some things. We're powering past coal and bringing some other countries with us. Nationally as I mentioned before Costa Rica, an ex-IDS student who's president of Costa Rica decided they weren't going to develop large swathes of the uh, fossil fuels that they could potentially exploit. France, Belize New Zealand, others are doing similar sorts of things. And engaging finance, we saw last week the largest uh, sovereign wealth fund in Norway deciding to, to divest from fossil fuels and we're seeing more and more of that uh, momentum uh, driven by the fossil fuel divestment movement. So there are some positive things going on. And I also see new models of ownership emerging. People, again, don't want to use this phrase, taking back control <laughs> in a positive way. Taking back control of food systems, energy systems, reclaiming spaces. Um, lots of the things that were in John's book on uh, uh, citizen innovation for a new economy, right? People are, they're not waiting around, they're developing, there's another phrase I've read the other day, now, um, yeah, nowtopias, and people call themselves nowtopians, they're not waiting for distant utopias to arrive, they're not deferring and waiting for elites to do this for them, they're just doing it in the here and now. So by living differently, by working by different values, by mobilising people, uh, they're, they're building, you know, they're making transformations in the here and now. Some of this is also about reducing consumption. Again, something that's very, very difficult politically to talk about. But proposals for a four-day working week, for example, that are being tried in some parts of the world. Often these are driven by crises, the need to cut back budgets, but there are ways in which Greens are now talking about using them as a positive way of trying to reduce stress, have more time with family, reduce workload, and reduce uh, consumption patterns. Trying to address issues of planned obsolescence through repair cafes that are taking off, etc. These all feel like small and anecdotal examples of things going on around the world, but they add up to something quite significant, I think. And given that in this lecture series we're talking about the SDGs, I wanted to also just say that I think the SDGs allow us an opportunity to do something different. Because they are universal, because they are interconnected, it means in theory that richer countries shouldn't be able to, probably will, but shouldn't be able to displace these problems onto poor countries through spatial or temporal fixes in quite the same way. We can't just solve our transport and energy problems by you know, taking over land and setting up, uh, you know, using land for biofuels, for example, if it's compromising food security for other people. Because though, you know, these commitments, these SDG commitments are intertwined. They are universal. I know many end up talking about them as applying largely to the global south. They do not. They apply to the global north as well. And there is some radical potential in there that I think we can use uh, in all of this. But more fundamentally and problematically, I think it means recognising the unsustainability of the current economic system. It means going beyond business as usual. So some analysis from the New Economics Foundation found that growth in OECD countries cannot be squared with halting warming at two, three or four degrees. They were looking at different rates of, of economic growth and the extent to which they were compatible with different climate change scenarios. And what they found is that even in the most optimistic, likely uptake of low carbon energy, it was seemingly impossible to reconcile a growing global economy with a good likelihood of limiting global temperature to rise even to two degrees, let alone 1.5. And the scientist climate, uh, Kevin Anderson and, and others have said uh, similar things. Now I realise these are difficult, uncomfortable, taboo subjects, particularly in uh, a development audience. Um, but I do think we need to take seriously equity-based ideas about how to achieve this sort of thing. It sounds like a very abstract thing to think about. Some of you studying climate change may have come across this idea. It's been around for a very, very long time. It has the support of quite a few developing countries. It's the idea of contraction and convergence. That all of us, every single person in the world, has a per capita entitlement to, to carbon, right? So if you think of the remaining carbon budget that we have, if we're serious about getting towards these targets, um, then you have to think about ways of allocating that. And what it implies is that richer countries have to decrease much more rapidly. The rest of the world, poorer countries have much more time to do that. And it's this process of richer countries contracting in order to free up ecological space, to free up carbon space for poorer countries to increase increase their emissions to meet um, basic, basic needs. And so it's a shift that I'm calling for, in, not in terms of just power, 
placing equity centrally, but also putting down limits to protect the commons. I think this is a, cr a crucial thing. So it's not, it can no longer just be, as it has been for so, so long now, around just pricing carbon, mobilising finance, innovating technology, those sorts of things. It does force us, I would argue, to conclude, to think about who and what development is for. And that might mean a greater degree of regulation, especially regarding the conduct of, of the rich, countries and people. A fundamental redef redefinition of progress and well-being beyond growth, supporting the livelihoods of the poor in the world instead of um, viewing them as sites of accumulation and speculation. It does mean having to change structures of ownership and property regimes over energy, land and water. It might imply greater degrees of self-sufficiency and uh, localisation. Now, all of this takes time and struggle, as all transformations do. And it may well sound, even as I say it myself, it sounds utopian and naive, but no more so, I would argue, than to suggest that we can merely tweak a model of business as usual development that is demonstrably, demonstrably leading to ecological ruin. So my wish actually is that we didn't have climate policy or any kind of environmental policy, that trade policy was genuinely sustainable, that energy policy was genuinely sustainable and transport policy and agricultural policy, so that we didn't have a need for a separate end of pipe policy to try and fix the damage caused by business as usual. And so ultimately it's about a realignment of priorities in which it's recognised that the economy is a mere subsystem of a global ecology. As activists like to point out, there is after all no economy on a dead planet. This is clearly a far more transformational agenda than that which the development industry is currently willing to uh, contemplate. But surely with 11 years uh, in which to avoid climate breakdown, it's time for a wake up call. Okay. Thank you. Pete, thank you so much. Um, as expected, I think you've given us a superbly powerful talk and one that is in its own way a wake-up call. I'd like to think that to many in this room, the wake-up call about the whole reconfiguring of development isn't so much new news. I mean, if one actually thinks about the way that IDS, Sussex, um, the International Development Department, the way we're teaching and thinking about development here, we actually incorporate into that notions around transformative change towards a fairer and more sustainable world. And climate change is clearly a key part of that. Um, but I think the, the trench and critique you've offered us of business as usual, um, which is still the way development is thought about in many, many quarters, is, is really important. And before I open it up, I will just add, I've just come from a two-day conference at Wilton Park um, around China's Belt and Road Initiative and um, the Sustainable Development Goals, where we're looking there at China's rise as a global development superpower with nine billion pound initiatives, which are likely to affect at least 70% of the world's population. And one of the clear mantras there was that actually, unless China in its outward development does something about its investment in coal-fired power stations and fossil fuel infrastructure, the world is going to be even further away from being on track to meet 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees. So I think um, we've got some big new patterns of development um, which also have to respond to the kind of challenge that, that Pete's laid out for us. Anyway, let's now open it up to questions and comments. We've got about 40 minutes. I'll take the perhaps in some groups and then you can then you can come back and would also welcome questions from our online audience. So over to you. I will we'll sit, but I will spot people. So who'd like to start? And do please give, give us your name yeah. when you ask a question. Yeah, absolutely. And say where you're from. Okay, so Danny. Hi there, yeah. Um, Danny Burns from IDS. Um, I haven't really got too many questions because I agree with 100% of everything you said. Um, I think the issue for me is what do we do about it? Um, I think when you looked at that, when you put up that WDM diagram, it really struck me as being really very similar to the military industrial complex and the ways in which business and uh, governments um, are completely interconnected. 
What that says to me is that um, we're not going to persuade business or government to change, we have to make them change. And that has to be built from a citizens' movement. And right now, the biggest citizens' movement, which is growing at extreme pace, is Extinction Rebellion. Uh, it's a civil disobedience movement, and, it's, and it requires civil disobedience because governments aren't going to change without it. So I think I want to state really clearly, as an IDS academic, that I support civil disobedience. I want everybody around us to come together behind that um, and use our positional power to make that happen. Um, and anybody that wants to join the Extinction Rebellion group that kicked off today at IDS with 20 people and another 25 that said they wanted to come and will be involved, just look me up, Danny Burns, and we'll put you on the mailing list and hopefully we can get things together. And Pete, I hope you guys on the other side of the road will also do something parallel and join with us. Okay. Great, and it would be really good, Pete, to have your comments on Extinction Rebellion in relation to and alongside some of these other movements that are also springing up. So let's take some more. Who else would like to come forward? You're all silenced into either total agreement or, or fear of the future. Yes, just next to you, James. Not too depressed, <laughs> Hey, uh, my name is Noah, I'm from the US and I'm studying poverty here at IDS. Um, and coming from the US context, um, I wonder sort of how you deal with uh, countries who refuse to accept um, climate change, or at least governments who refuse to accept and act on climate change. Um, and then also sort of as a follow-up to that, um, there are portions of the US government who, who are pushing for what they're calling a Green New Deal um, and sort of pushing economic growth through uh, green energy and, and things like that. And I wonder what your thoughts on, on that and the potential for that in sort of development and economic development in um, the Global South are. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and James, just behind you, I've got a question here. That, yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's, uh, first you and then you, let's take both of those. Whichever, why don't you speak? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Hi, I'm Asha, um, student at IDS. I'm just curious about where conflict and security comes in with climate change, mm -hmm. particularly on your topic, because obviously resource scarcity is going to become a really big part of climate change, and I'm just curious as to how we're going to tackle that, particularly in, well, everywhere, not just Global South, but Global North, the whole yeah, yeah. context. Thank you. Great question. And was there somebody over there just in the row next to you, or not? Okay. No. Well, why don't look, three very big questions, so why don't you come back Huge. on those to yeah. begin with? Great. Okay. Well, maybe I'll take them in reverse order, actually. So Asha's question, climate security. Yeah, that's a, it's a big issue. Um, and it really divides the academic community in terms of how to think about this. So there are many studies that talk about climate wars. They're quite sort of new Malthusian in terms of some of their predictions about rising population pressures, scarce resources, this leading inevitably towards war and conflict. Many other scholars, including my colleague Jan Silby in the International Relations Department here, will be far more critical about some of those narratives and discourses um, and suggest that you know, climate change is absolutely one of the things which could magnify and exacerbate existing drivers of conflict. Um, but we need to be a bit careful about predicting uh, conflict and war resulting from diminished resources as a result of climate change and then populations being forcibly removed from those areas because they're prone to conflict and there's you know, been some evidence of that. So I'm wary sometimes of the climate wars discourse. Um, on the other hand, it's important to recognise that it's one of the drivers and that there's a, there is an you know, increased likelihood of conflict over certain types of resources uh, if we fail to, to get a handle on climate change. And, uh, so that's that's undoubtedly the case. So it, it can be a mobilising thing and it's attractive for many environmentalists to make that linkage because, you know, a bit like Danny's point, talking about the military industrial complex, if you get the attention of the military and the resources they have, then climate change, you know, goes up the agenda quite quickly and that's very attractive for some people. But perhaps the last thing we need is military type thinking in, in tackling climate change, thinking about it in terms of zero sum uh, 
wins basically you know what we really need here is is collaboration uh cooperation because that's the other way where there are shared resources where there is potential for conflict that can also lead to new international agreements around sharing river basins etc there are there are other outcomes that aren't inevitably about conflict so i think we need to sort of think outside the box a bit mm. but that's but it's a challenging area yeah. uh the colleague from the us whose name i didn't catch uh what do you do about the us it's a really good point i mean i think we saw this after Bush de declared that he was going to somehow cancel the Paris Agreement uh, in, his, in his terms and said that he spoke for Pittsburgh and not Paris. And then the mayor of Pittsburgh stood up and said, well, actually, we want to be part of <laughs> the climate yeah. agreement yeah. anyway. Um, so I think one entry point is working with states. There's a lot of states around the US that are already tied into things like C40 and ICLE and other initiatives which are bringing states together to set their own quite ambitious, in some cases, targets to bring down emissions and to try and deal with uh, climate adaptation. Businesses as well, there are a number of you know, wealthy entrepreneurs, you know, very competitive firms in California and elsewhere that are doing very well out of the low carbon economy. They want to invest more in solar and wind and make sure that the US maintains a competitive uh, position vis-a-vis -vis China and India and other countries. And so there is a drive from the business community to still be part of that. And they're often networked with other trans-governmental or non-governmental alliances. So I think the entry points are there. But also even within the state, I think as you were implying in your question, it's not a, a, a homogenous state where all departments and all actors take a particular view. Trump is trying to keep tight control over this, and he's bringing the climate skeptics in, he's trying to discredit things, he's cancelling lines of climate finance. But there is pushback, you know, and you mentioned it yourself, the Green New Deal, there's a lot of interest and mobilisation around that. There are other parts, other departments even within the US government that are far more progressive. Mm -hmm. Uh, on this issue and when I talk to them at the climate negotiations they're trying their best they're just having to maneuver in different ways so I don't give up on the US <laughs> uh, and then Danny's point I mean very well taken I understand I, I think um, Extinction Rebellion has grown at a phenomenal rates and they've also been behind some of the declarations of climate emergency I think there's over 40 now in the UK alone um, and that's um, I think that's been really positive and really useful. The question for me now is, what does it mean to declare a climate emergency? What extra powers does it give you? Uh, can they be used constructively and inclusively? That's the other thing, um, because we can come onto this perhaps in another part of the discussion, but when you emphasize urgency, short time frames, that can also give credence to elite uh, visions about how to tackle climate change, which might be around fracking, which might be around nuclear, which might be around geoengineering. In other words, it's too late to do anything more substant substantive or to do any of the things I was talking about. We just have to go for the big techno fixes. Uh, and we're seeing that, right, with the UK government. So when Lancashire Council said we don't want fracking, the UK government said, well, we're going to override that because, you know, and one of the reasons they gave was this is we're facing the need to transition to low carbon forms of energy. Fracking's part of that story. Sorry, we're going to override you in terms of national interest. So you need to be careful what you wish for sometimes in some of those uh, framings. But I think Extinction Rebellion has made a, a really important contribution. I guess what we're trying to do with this Rapid Transition Alliance and this you know, has a membership of around 50 organisations now, largely civil society organisations. But we're trying to push what we call evidence-based hope. <laughs> Precisely, so I think Extinction Rebellion is really good on saying, calling out the inaction, making people really aware of the reality of what we're up against, and that's hugely valuable. But I also think you need the stories of hope about things that can be done, um, and to show that things are actually happening around the world, and that in different ways we've done this before in the past, historically. Although I said, you know, if you look at it as an entirety, we're on new terrain. We have shifted transport, uh, you know, infrastructures over short periods of time. We have mobilised finance over very short periods of time. Behaviours do change over short periods of time. And I think it's worth putting the accent on, on the hopeful, the positive, the, the stuff that's transformational in the here and now as well. Okay, excellent. And gets one back to this question of what does actually motivate people as well. Is it is it fear? Is it is it the future future disaster, or is it actually the possibility of making a difference? Really interesting debate. Okay, so there's another question here. We've got lots of hands going up now, so we'll go to you, and then we'll come down to our Egypt colleague. Uh, hello, I'm Georgie. I'm from the UK. I'm doing MA governance. I was wondering, um, assuming that the national government does get its act together and start doing things uh, to, to counteract or just to make policy for all climate change. What sort of policies you envision, how they go about it, as you've already mentioned, it uh, interacts with it, it exacerbates a lot of structural inequalities. 
Um, something that I keep hearing about is taxation, how to change that. Um, obviously, we need international agreements, but I was wondering at a particularly national level and with reference to this country or any other country, what sort of action you would envision given the emergency situation? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So, can we just hear? Yeah. Hello, hi, thank you again for this uh, talk. Um, my name is Dina. I'm working on my PhD here at IDS. And I might, this might be a conservative question, and um, I'm just going to go for it. So I'm, I'm interested in, in asking about how we distinguish between transition and transformation, especially in a relationship to equity. So my, I, before coming here, I was briefly involved with a project trying to incorporate a feed-in tariff uh, process for solar energy. Mm -hmm. And Egypt is now trying to develop the largest solar park in the world. And it, it is a classic example of what you're discussing in terms of seeing a lot of these trade-offs of using the business as usual language mm -hmm. in order to get into that shift. But then at the same time, if the country or the private sector firms, many of which are small scale private sector firms trying to catch on to multilateral funds that are coming from very large yeah. organizations, if they miss out on that opportunity, is that not also a question of equity? So I, I'm, I'm just curious, how will we draw the line on this? Yeah. Okay, that's an interesting one. <clears throat> So, um, okay, so I think we'll go, we've got a question from our online audience, so we'll go over there. Um, yeah, so this is a question from um, Poonan. Um, how, how are Global North donors and Global Development Aid agencies responding to climate change initiatives in the Global South? Okay, question about donors. Another big one. Um, John, so coming to John Gaventura here at the front. Thanks, Pete. Great, great talk. Uh, John Cavente at IDS. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how to build alliances even across issues in civil society. I was recently at a big meeting in Senegal of the Publish What You Pay movement, which is a big civil society organization and network, hundreds of members, dozens of countries, trying to make the fossil fuels industry more accountable and responsive. And on, on one hand, that can, they, they aren't really picking up the question of leave it in the ground as a way of being ultimately accountable and responsive. Mm. And in Senegal, of course, they have a lot of new discoveries of fuel, and there was an open evening one evening uh, to have a debate between the accountability activist and the environmental activist, uh, arguing we need to leave it in the ground. But of course, for many of the Senegalese organizations, this was really not something they were interested in because the hope has been that that extraction will occur to help deal with economic issues in that country. Yep. So I, I think we have a lot of work to do amongst our, the networks of civil society organizations who may be not building alliances around this in the best way possible. Yeah, yeah. that's a really good point. So is there one more in this round? Um, okay, let's go right to the back there. So I'll keep James running around here. <laughs> Hi, thank you for that. Uh, Fatima from India, studying uh, MEDF at IDS. Um, so you mentioned that, of course, these multinational organizations have to be held accountable for the fossil fuel em uh, emissions, and at the same time, citizens also have to take, respons uh, take responsibility for changing consumption patterns. But at the same time, I feel like uh, this focus on uh, consumers changing their patterns is a bit unfair in the sense that um, it's also only mostly the elite who can actually afford to change their consumer pa consumption patterns. So how can we sort of balance that um, in terms of yeah. uh, holding MNCs accountable for emissions more than people, I guess? Uh, especially in a more global south context. Yeah. Okay. Great. So that's the whole set which really touch in different ways on this kind of climate change versus equity and how they can be <coughs> made more compatible. So. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so, okay, this time I'll take them in the order in which they came. Georgia, was it Georgia that asked the first one, or Georgine? Yeah, Georgia. Georgia, okay. Um, so you were asking about what concrete national policies would you want to see? Um, so there's plenty, really. Um, I mean, for me, a lot of it starts with planning, just proper planning. <laughs> 
um, so that you don't put new supermarkets or shops out of town in places where people need cars to get to them. Um, so you design infrastructures in more environmentally minded ways to try and reduce consumption, to enable mobility on public transport, uh, to allow um, micro forms of energy to be produced, you know, mini grids, these sorts of things. So it's basic infrastructural decisions that are making it easier to do the right thing um, and you know reversing um, the sort of more and more more lock-ins. There's things about basic planning, and when I say planning, what I also think we need to do is reverse some really bad planning decisions, like expanding Heathrow Airport, like going for fracking, going for fracking. These things which are, are being contested in the courts right now, and a Greenpeace and others are contesting the Heathrow decision. I mean, that's just to stop things getting worse. That's not rolling it back. That's just saying, let's not make any more of, of, the, of the really problematic choices. And I was hearing earlier today, this is something I don't know about, and many of you in the room may know more about this. There's a push now around greater accountability around public procurement. So whether it's cities, municipalities, or national government making decisions, investing in new infrastructures, that there should now be an explicit climate check so although we have like a climate change committee in this country that looks at overall national budgets, this would take it down a level and impose a sort of duty of care, if you like, a, a responsibility on public institutions to make sure that what they're proposing is compatible with what we're trying to do in terms of decarbonisation and hitting climate targets. And I think that's fundamental, that type of thing. So those proper sort of checks and balances, screening mechanisms, if you like. And that goes across the board. I mean, activists have argued for a long time to have proper screening of export credit agencies and how we use overseas money. I think that would be uh, really important. Taxation you raised. I think there's a big, there is a big role for ecological taxation, carbon taxation, those sorts of things. Um, shifting subsidies. You know, 10 million US dollars an hour are still spent on fossil fuels, subsidising fossil fuels. This is your money, it's my money, it's all of our public money still going towards propping up these industries. Now, in some parts of the world, it could be kerosene subsidies in rural India, and you might think that's perfectly viable. But a lot of this is production subsidies to Shell and to BP and to other oil multinationals. And this doesn't strike me as a good use of state money in the moment we're in. So I think there's plenty that can be done to reverse bad decisions, but also improve new things. And I think a Green New Deal type vision, where you're you know, properly trying to invest in new jobs, in, in infrastructures that are far more compatible with a 1.5 pathway, make a lot of sense. Uh, so Dina's point about the difference between transition and transformation, it's an important one, and I was probably a bit loose in my use of it here. Transition often alludes to shifts to, to pricing, to technology, changing the way you provide a service, whether it's transport or energy or food, but without shifting the overall direction of change or the power relations around it. Transformation does do those things. You're fundamentally trying to shift the direction of change, who's involved in shaping that change, and where the power lies. So it's far more, yeah, tr as the name suggests, transformational, right? So it's not, tr trans transitions you can have all the time, and they just plug in different technologies, energy sources, and you carry on as before with more or less the same business as usual model. Your other point though about can external funding support innovation amongst smaller small and medium sized enterprises, I think there's a really important role there um, and I wouldn't want to take that away. That's where that would be a positive use of, of donor money in my view to try and support entrepreneurs trying to get things off the ground that are genuinely serving local needs. What I am concerned about is the big the giving of money to major oil, gas and coal companies um, who are often extracting those profits and benefits and the developing countries don't see those benefits. So it's a good point to sort of be a bit more nuanced about the, the funding and, and where, where it can be uh, directed. Uh, so the online question, this is Puna, what, what global uh, northern donor reactions to climate initiatives in the south? I guess it would depend which ones. Uh, if it's supporting feed-in tariffs in Egypt or doing that in Kenya, which I also saw, then that, I see that as a positive thing. Um, trying to de-risk certain forms of investment, enable certain types of um, technologies to get off the ground around ones which meet multiple needs and so not just thinking about it in terms of climate change. I think that can be a good thing. I think governments in the South have come up with very bold and progressive things which donors sometimes don't want to support. So you might think about the Ecuadorian government coming up with the Asuni initiative, right? We will keep these resources in the ground, but we need some compensation for doing it. Now send us your checks. <laughs> and one or two countries did. 
you know, Norway and I think Germany and one or two other countries put some money up, but it wasn't nearly enough to make it worthwhile for the, uh, the government of Ecuador to keep those resources in the ground. But it was a bold, interesting, important, in my view, initiative that wasn't supported. So the question how are donors reacting, it depends very much on the initiative, I think. Uh, John's point, building alliances, uh, I think this is crucial and it's going on, but it's really difficult. I don't need to tell you this. But building alliances with trade unions around just transitions, that's always very, very difficult. If we are talking about managed decline of certain sectors in certain areas, um, who pays for the compensation or the retraining packages for workers that are going to be losing their jobs? How do we deal with those sorts of things? It raises very, very difficult conversations. Um, it was an interesting talk in Sprue actually a few weeks ago by someone from one of the unions who was saying that we need to think in less sectorally. We need to talk about the fate of energy workers. Can we provide viable, secure future for energy workers and not think about defending jobs in fracking or in nuclear as opposed to solar or wind or whatever? Because that's how she was saying the unions are tending to think about this. That there's a knee-jerk reaction to say, well, this threatens fracking or nuclear, and therefore we need to resist it, and therefore the alliance breaks down. But what if you're able to conceptualise it slightly more broadly? We want a growing base of energy workers that are contributing to a more sustainable economy and have a secure future, etc. Um, obviously, interesting alliances with Indigenous peoples groups going on um, all, all the time. Um, your question about extraction, who benefits from the extraction, I think that's the really important point. Obviously, I can understand in any sort of meeting where a country has just discovered a new stream of gas or a new oil reserve, that it's a very, very difficult thing to, to try and discuss and contemplate. All I would say is, and I think a lot of community groups know this from experience, they're rarely the beneficiaries once that extraction kicks off. We know enough about resource curses in development to know that the likely beneficiaries of oil booms, gas booms, coal booms are, are not likely to be the local. In the short term they might be and there may be one or two leaders or intermediaries that will take their cut from that and benefit from that. So I think it will very much depend on you know who controls those sorts of conversations. I understand obviously the need, the desperate need people have to get, carve out a livelihood out of anything. On the other hand I think there's an opportunity to try and push in an alternative direction that would be uh, would be preferable great well okay. done that was another lot um Oh no, there's one more, there's oh, one there more, one Patna, more. yeah, Patna's yeah. question about consumers. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a really, really important one because there's a lot of attention now to shifting consumer behaviour and often it becomes very individualised. It's a sort of as if we're all in isolation making these choices and you can put all the burdens on the consumers to say, well, you have to choose stuff that's low carbon and it's fair trade and it's good on animal welfare. And really, we're all living within infrastructures of choices, right? I mean... We, notionally, in a market liberal economy, we all have endless choices. You know, you can go to the supermarket and there's 50 different types of eggs you could buy, but actually you don't because of your budget, the amount of money you have, um, how those things are produ produced. So I think there is something about awareness raising, about shifting behaviours, thinking about diet and transport and all those sorts of things. We do have that responsibility, but those things are heavily structured by, by pricing mechanisms, by infrastructures which encourage more unsustainable behaviours. And so I'm I am concerned about the individualization of responsibility when it's taken out of abstraction from the bigger structural forces, if you like. Uh, clearly it has to be both, but I think we need to be wary of saying, look at this big historical structural problem, now you deal with it. <laughs> it's all down to you. I don't think that's particularly mobilizing or empowering or fair, frankly, yeah. and particularly so in the global south. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Claire. Great. So we can be open to another round. So further questions? Okay, so we've got another question from our online audience. Okay, this one is from Abinhav from India. Um, how do we actually get climate change on the political agenda? From an Indian perspective, there are some good examples in some states like Kerala running their airport on solar power, which makes me think that where there's a will, work can be done. Okay, that's a good, good example. Um, yeah, okay, so let's come to you here in the middle of the row. Hello, Gerardo. I'm a PhD student here at IDS. Hello, Peter. Come with us. Um, so you mentioned uh, plenty of things that we can do to, to overcome this crisis. However, you didn't mention questioning economic growth itself, right? So I was just wondering what, what, what's your take on, on um, whether you consider that there is a possible alliance between Rapid Transition Alliance and all of these movements, 
with the derailed perspective, right? Okay, good question. So on the bigger growth agenda, right? Yes, in the centre here. Oh, hello there. Um, my name is Ben Van Ness. I'm originally from Holland. I've been farming in this country for about 40 years. And um, I'm not only in farming, I'm, I'm very much into conservation uh, with Natural England here in this country. And perhaps I can offer a slightly different take on the whole thing of, you know, global um, pollution and so on. I'm, I'm also a charity worker in Africa. So I spend a lot of time in the field with farmers in Africa. and. Um, I, I've seen firsthand, actually, when the rains don't come, what it actually means to people mm. uh, at a, on a practical level. Because the seeds don't germinate and people don't eat. It's very much a lot of people there, subsistence farming. Uh, at the same time, of course, um, you know, yeah, people go hungry. It's a serious problem for the poor. Um, in Brazil also, I mean, it's not often mentioned, actually, deforestation around the world. I think the last 10 years we've, we've lost on average 20 million acres of trees every year. 20 million acres, roughly. And at the same time we have uh, an extra 30 million cars on the road around the world. Um, so we have a double whammy as far as you know, trees disappearing, trees make climate, and so on and so on. And topsoil, we're losing topsoil at an alarming rate. Um, I've seen it with my own eyes. The burning of the rainforest, the topsoil washes into the rivers. Again, we're losing fertility. Um, so, I've heard many, many good points here today. Um, solar power, I think, is wonderful for South America, places like Africa, but people can't afford it. So, but my question really is, how can we stop deforestation? Should we just give Brazil a big check and say, you know, put a fence around this rainforest? Because it's an amazing place, guys. We're losing so much biodiversity there by burning the rainforest and, and obviously locking the timber. You were mentioning about the Chinese. I meet a lot of Chinese people everywhere, especially in Africa. Um, they are really buying every mountain that's full of copper, everything else, and uh, building the roads, obviously, to go with it. So um, I thought it's a practical sort of <coughs> view, and um, I would love to save more trees. How can we do this? Thank you. OK, that's a good one. <laughs> So, yeah, okay, coming to you, Claire. Sorry, I've been waiting a long time. <laughs> um, what about, uh, what do you do about countries? <laughs> Let's get the microphone the right way. Uh, what do you do about countries that just don't care in the same way that we do? I'm thinking of Mongolia, uh, which is absolutely booming, doesn't need aid from anyone, and uh, has a lot and, and depends very heavily on coal, which is affordable and easily transportable to where it's used, which is in Ulaanbaatar. They, there is no incentive for the people of Mongolia to change. They even will put up with the terrible pollution in the winter and carry on using coal. Okay, well, that's a really good point. Let's take, if there are another couple of questions, we could take those and then come back to you if you're able to keep track of all of yep. those. That cold and beer we'll is just... <laughs> yep, all right. So, um, one distance. more from the online, then we'll go to you, John. Okay, this is from Amazon Rose. Um, what's, your, what's your opinion on the interwined nature of UK politics and the fossil fuel industry, e.g. oil tax breaks and lobbying, key decision makers ahead of climate, of climate, uh, ahead of climate talks in order to influence policy? Yeah. Yep. And then finally, I think we'll come to John Thompson there. John Thompson, IDS. Uh, great talk, Pete. Uh, question, you highlighted a lot of initiatives, the grassroots, the, the alliances, uh, movement from below, uh, and we can see how that can make progress. But you also alluded to the, the, how we're stuck at some of, the, in some of the global institutions, and you mentioned the World Bank and others, that we're still framing the debate in particular ways, and that led to certain sorts of investment decisions and, and policy actions. How do we bring about change in terms of global governance and global institutions, the Bretton Woods and others, to shift the way they go about doing business? Yeah. It's great that we have those actions from below to, to challenge and confront, but we also need change from above as well as below. How do we do that? 
Right. Whoa. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that the time? <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, I'll take them in the I mean, order in which they can. can. No, wait, I'll try. How long, so how long have we got? We've got about another 10, 15 minutes. Okay, so if you that's just good. deal with, with yeah, those yeah. and any final remarks, and okay. then probably better wind up. So the online question, first of all, that came from India, I didn't hear the person's name. How do we get climate change onto the agenda in a country like India? Well, I think that was more or less the question. Uh, it's already on the agenda, is, is how I would respond to that. Um, I mean, it, there's numerous things going on at state level in India and at national level. Um, so things like the solar mission, like bold, bold initiatives to try and increase the, the amount of solar energy in the mix. And often climate change isn't really the driver. So maybe this comes back to the Mongolia point as well. It's often not the key driver. So in Mongolia, it might be air pollution or air quality or the rising health costs. You know, can the Mongolian state carry on dealing with the health related costs of hospitals being full of people that can't you know, don't have access to breathable air. So it might not be climate change. They would think, well, that's not a problem that we really caused. We don't see the effects in the here and now, but there are other manifestations of its effects that, that would be more direct, more tangible, and have more, more uh, you know, more tr have more truck in the here and now. Um, so, um, yeah, in the India case, it's, again, it's not necessarily climate change per se, although I think that's, that's coming. And when you talk to sort of um, Confederation of Indian Industry or other business groups, they're clearly part of this agenda. They, they, some of the responses are still quite conventional in lots of ways. It's about, you know, carbon trading, carbon markets, and there's an internal um, perform achieve trade scheme, which is around energy efficiency within India. So there's numerous initiatives going on. Often the driver is trying to reduce de uh, dependency on oil imports and things like that. So it's often an energy security agenda mm. rather than a climate change agenda but frankly I don't care what the driver is as long as some of the those actions are starting to, to, to roll out mm. um, so you know it is it's an um, that's an important part of the story uh, Gerardo's question about growth, prosperity. I thought I was quite critical about growth and was trying to sort of push in, in that direction about the need to open up the conversation about prosperity and degrowth. And as you know, there's a politics about how you label it. Should it be degrowth? Is that defining yourself negatively in relation to something? Can you talk more about well-being, prosperity, the Tim Jackson type arguments? Uh, I think that's probably a, a more fruitful way to go, but it's incredibly hard to do that. Everything in our political discourse, uh, how we count growth and progress in the economy is all hung on this ideology of growth, which has been so fixed for so long. And there's a lot of interesting work, people showing that historically that wasn't always the case, that this has become the key metric we use, GMP and national accounting and so on. And of course, Simon Kuznick said, whatever you do, don't use it for that purpose, <laughs> right? Um, and as Kennedy said, you know, growth measures everything apart from the most important things in life, you know, and it's true. It doesn't value the things that we really, uh, that really count. Uh, everything gets subsumed beneath growth indicators. So if there's more suicides, there's more car crashes, there's more accidents, this is all economic activity which counts as growth. It gives us no meaningful indication of whether we're actually progressing, let alone moving towards meeting SDG. So there are important conversations to be had, but it has to be part of an equity conversation. I think that's what I was trying to get at in the climate case with reference to contraction and convergence, but it comes up in any other conversation about just transitions or transformations, like holding those the multiple equity parts in, in that. Understandably, going back to John's point in a way, poorer communities could experience this as a threat. You know, just at the time we're on the verge of getting some growth, richer countries or activists are coming in and telling us, telling us we can't have it. But ultimately, I think what most people are after is economic security, well-being, health, security, these sorts of things. And for me, growth is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. Okay, that's the important distinction. Insofar as it brings about happiness, well-being, security, prosperity, health, great. But it's not at the moment. For large swathes of the world's population, it's also driving us over the edge ecologically. So we have to do something about that. And it has to be richer countries for historical and contemporary reasons that take the lead on that. That's, I think, the entry point for conversations with, mm -hmm. with poorer countries to say this is not about you taking the lead first, but we do need a different way of doing this. And for all the reasons I also sketched out, richer countries have an enormous amount of structural power through our companies, through aid, through investment, through the products we will buy, and we can use that power in more productive ways to encourage alternatives and support alternatives. Um, 
deforestation, uh, that, I mean, I think it's a huge part of the story. It's a massive, we have to deal with deforestation effectively if we're going to get a handle on climate change. Um, I think big shifts in food and agricultural production are abs absolutely critical to that. A large part of the story here is obviously industrial agriculture, deforestation for the production of GM soya, things like that is an important part of the story. This is all for creating soya pellets to feed meat, <laughs> to feed animals for meat production. So there's numerous entry points into that conversation about how you deal with, with deforestation. Um, in the immediate term, it'd be great if we could get Bolsonaro out of power. <laughs> um, Forming alliances with indigenous peoples that are frankly going to be in the front line. There's going to be, there already are. I mean, Alex can talk to this theme, but there's, you know, lots of bloody conflicts between people who are going to be driven off their land to clear these forests for agribusiness. Now, again, Western companies, companies that we do have some control over or do have shares in maybe or some power over are investing in these things. You know, that Cargill and McDonald's and others, there's been quite a few campaigns that Greenpeace and others have led to put pressure on them not to buy products that come from deforestation, so whether it's palm oil or GM soy or whatever it might be. So we can use that retail power, that supply chain power to bring about some of those shifts. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also a question of allying with people on the ground that are trying to defend their own livelihoods <coughs> against these incursions. I think that has to be uh, an important part of the mm -hmm. story. And so, yeah, it's partly about demand, it's partly about uh, supply, as always. Claire so maybe I've partly answered your, your point about I think that's the way and it's not to say climate change, climate change, you need to act on this and say well we didn't really cause it and you know slightly warmer temperatures in Mongolia in winter probably wouldn't be such a bad thing, it's probably how most people experience it. Um, but I think it's enabling transitions in, in other countries so when there are choices about investments in new infrastructure and the temptation is to go for a, a new motorway what if the international community said, well, we can try and provide a new train system, you know, that we, we can calculate, and this is the sort of thing that carbon finance is quite good at doing. You can say, actually, there's a trajectory in which we go for mass transportation systems, buses that are affordable. This is happening in parts of Latin America or train systems. Um, and we'll fund the difference. We'll calculate how much carbon we would have saved, and then we'll, you know, we'll pay for those sorts of things. So those key moments that all countries face, rich countries, we have it in the UK, we're doing it over Heathrow, but other poorer countries as well. We're saying we now need to meet this transport need or this food need or this energy. There's different ways of doing it. This is our preferred course or this is what we can afford. And it, then the onus is on the international community to say, well, let's try and tip the, the balance in favour of doing it in a lower carbon and a more sustainable way. I think that's the key thing. Uh, so the other question that came in online was about fossil fuel industry lobbying in the UK. Yes. <laughs> they do it all the time. They always have done. They make huge contributions to Conservative Party funds. Mm -hmm. They're always lobbying for tax breaks. Uh, they always want subsidies. And if you look at the, I mean, I think transparency is one way into this. Um, some of the shaming about the number of meetings that have been held with the fracking industry as opposed to solar and wind companies, for example. Just trying to show some of the systematic bias um, which, um, which is out there in terms of financial flows, access to key committees and institutions, politicians that are sitting on the boards of some of these companies, you know, exposing that, what I called the fossil, well, what WDM called the fossil fuel web of power. I think that's really important as a first, um, as a first port of call. You know, you say you're serious about climate change, you say you're doing all these things, and then look at actually where the money's flowing, who's sitting on the key committees. Uh, John Thompson's question, global institutions, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I sort of threw that out there a few times, but I didn't really push what I meant by that. There, there is now pressure. World Bank has made various statements about not investing in new coal. There is this pressure on you know, the African um, Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, to sort of slowly withdraw these sorts of investments over time. Um, uh, what I don't see, and I've spoken to World Bank officials about this recently, that bigger conversation that Gerardo was planting there about degrowth or fundamentally thinking, the, they'll say, yeah, we're aware of that, uh, we know it's out there, but it's just taboo, there's just no way. We're, we're so locked into the existing way of doing things. I think that's sort of beyond the realm. But I do think, you know, thinking about the World Trade Organization, we will have to have more serious uh, attention to the environmental impact and climate impact of new trade rounds. 
I mean, activists have argued, argued for this for years and years. When you're proposing opening up a new sector to trade liberalisation, what is the likely social and environmental impact of that? Think about that before you do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, involve the people that will be affected by it. And maybe there should be more rights of veto. You, know, you can put slot in environmental standards and other things. Again, that's controversial. But we have to have ways of screening the likely impact. Is this taking us broadly in the right direction or is it just pushing down the accelerator in precisely the wrong direction? And that's what's happening at the moment. So, it, And you know, again, who, who are the governments that are funding these institutions? It, it's ours. It's the UK, it's the US, it's other powerful economies around the world. It's their money which is supporting these institutions. And in different ways they are using that leverage to say we will not fund these types of things. You know, These are the types of investments we do want to see. So there's that around the financing. But I actually think it's a bigger story about shifting their mandates. What are they for? Who are they for? Why is it the case that World Trade Organization will still get to trump environmental rules? That as we negotiate new multilateral environmental agreements, that those agreements live in the shadow of trade regulations and trade lobbyists are always saying, oh, well, it has to be compatible with the WTO, and if it's not, then you can't use any of these provisions. What world is that? You know, why do they get the right to trump other social, environmental, human rights provisions on the ground that there has to be WTO compatible? I think it's about challenging some of those fundamental yeah. premises as yeah. well. Fantastic. Well, Pete, I think you've done an extraordinary job, first of all, in getting through all that huge range of questions. But actually, really, in giving us, I think, what's been one of the most clear-sighted and deeply knowledgeable and analytical um, lectures on this super complex and super important set of problems and I mean I've learned a lot from this evening and I'm sure everybody else has and it's actually your ability to to analyze the politics of all of this at all levels and in a way that is looking looking to solutions as well as as well as analyzing problems I mean just by way of conclusion I mean I'm interested in how all of this relates to the SDGs because on the one hand and you did talk a little bit about the SDGs and it's the topic of our of our lecture on the one hand I think you've shown us that the climate change goal is so deeply interconnected with all the others in terms of synergies and sometimes tensions as you've talked about with equity with poverty and others which have to be resolved but at another level one could argue that the climate goal is the overarching goal that needs to needs to trump everything and it's quite interesting in relation to the SDGs because you can make that argument about many of the goals perhaps what this comes back to is that actually the important point about the SDGs is they do provide something of a roadmap and an inspiration for this kind of new development model a more transformative vision of the future we want to paraphrase where the SDGs go that is actually putting planet and people at its, at its heart, and which does need to transform the definitions we have of development as well as, as, well as the ways that we get there. I think I've also really appreciated what you've said about actually the transformations we need need to be driven at all levels and some of this will be top down and it'll involve new architectures and regulatory formats but equally some of it has to be bottom up and driven by people and driven by a politics that's about nowtopias and evidence-based hope to pick up two of your, your phrases um, as well as those more conventional instruments which are going to be inadequate of, of the market. So, Pete, thank you. Thank you for, for inspiring us and for, I think, clarifying a lot of key issues and for really making a fantastic contribution to this series. I will put in a plug now for the next um, Sussex Development Lecture on the SDGs, which in a very different way is going to pick up on many of these climate change issues because this next week, same time, same place, we have Salim al Hook talking about Bangladesh's road to tackling both climate change and poverty. So different rootedness, but very similar transformational questions, I think, will be at the heart of that talk from somebody who, again, is deeply knowledgeable and has been at the heart of these debates for a very long time. So I hope to see many of you here next week. But please join me one more time in thanking Pete for his fantastic.